portrays Hitler waking up right from the past into modern Berlin. In this smart satirical film, a good-hearted journalist who discovered Hitler and introduces him to the TV shows realizes after a while that what he had thought was a performer artist was indeed the fascist, the fascist leader in person. Sawatsky, the journalist, confronts Hitler in this dialogue. You are a monster, am I? Then you have to condemn those who elected this monster. Were they all monsters? No, they were ordinary people who chose to elect an extraordinary man and entrust the fate of the country to him. What do you want to do, Sawatsky? Ban elections? The differences between the contemporary masses that support Donald Trump and those that supported the National Socialist German Party that brought Hitler to power are vast. But the Hitler of Look Who's Back instantiates several aspects of the Trump phenomenon. That this barbarian could indeed be democratically elected as the next US president. That such dire scenario shows the dynamics at work between a charismatic leader, Trump, and the masses that support him. And also that there is a central performance aspect in Trump's leadership. We, we speak at Nassium about Trump's instigating violence, openly using highly racist, sexist, and anti-environmental statements. But shouldn't we turn our heads and look at what idiocy might be at play among the masses who support him? I will explain what I mean by idiocy, as this term serves as a critical approach and not as an offense. What type of mass? Trump's phenomenon is a psychological manifestation of the particular mass constituted by his followers. This mass's libidinal investment on Donald Trump is an effect of a hypnotic-like suggestion that he, as a leader, exerts on his followers. As such, they follow him by means of an identificatory process of love. In group psychology, Freud links masses, love, hypnosis, suggestion, and ego. And at the same time, he differentiates two types of masses. There are unorganized, unorganized, spontaneous, or natural masses in contrast with artificial masses such as the church or the military. Among the characteristics of the masses are a diminishing of their intellectual functioning, including criticism and moral consciousness, a diminish, diminishing in those functions, and the fact that the masses think mainly with images, similarly to daydreaming, the space where fantasy is in flame. Although masses can function without uh, leadership, in the Trump's phenomenon, he has been positioned as a leader. A leader needs to have prestige as a necessary attribution. In Lacanian terms, he needs to be the subject that supposedly knows. The leader exerts his power through enticing the fantasy that he loves each one of the individuals of that crowd, and it is this illusion that founds such mass. The essence of a mass consists in the established libidinal bonding, and such bonding presents as double, Freud explains. What bonds the masses is eros, through the process of identification both among the members of the group and with the leader. In Freudian terms, then, the masses that follow Trump have fell in love with the guy. How <coughs> pathetic is that? And they are loving the fact that they belong to such herd. But the masses and what binds them are a source of enormous power. Freud mentions that the mass has the ability to empower themselves and share enthusiasm. There are no impossibilities. Putting it that way, it is the time of this luxurious force who historic, which historical have created revolutionary change. However, it's not a revolution in the progressive sense what is in the horizon, but rather an idiotic enjoyment. The, libidina, um, the idiotic uh, enjoyment is the enjoyment vicariously through an imaginary fantasy. The libidinal bond of these masses, as most imaginary love, is idiotic because it is trapped in an enjoyment of the individual's own 
fixed narcissistic image projected and therefore embodied in another, their leader, Trump. Similarly to the way one enjoys celebrity gossip, the masses enjoy vicariously through the figure of the chosen leader. Frustrated and suffering the effects of years of dispossessing neoliberal practices, Trump's supporters position him as an ego ideal, a compensatory image of themselves projected into a fantasized future. In such fantasy, Trump, on their behalf, will reclaim the lost idea, ideal of the narcissistic national identity through his motto, Make America Great Again. By, new, by doing so, the masses hope that Trump will bring relief to their social economic stroke, struggles. If every mass of loving followers is potentially idiotic by virtue of enjoyment through the image, for example, those who supported Trudeau as a new leader in Canada, or the Greeks who supported the libertarian ideals of Syriza, and since images have an undeniable positive vitality as well, what makes idiocy problematic? The problem resides, I suggest, in lacking substance beyond the image. The poverty of thought and ideas is appalling. His strategy, all performative as part of his tradition in the show this, is merely imaginary and suggests to the masses via and suggestive to the masses via identification that his very own successes as a um, wealthy man and status will change the material conditions of the impoverished people who support him. Trump gains sympathies by portraying himself as a wealthy, yet approachable, common guy who can speak every man's language. Following Baudrillard, Trump's image, however, is oppressing and violent because it pretends that the real, the discrepant realities of him and his followers have disappeared. Trump's image, as any other psychic self-image aspiring subjective assertion, is on its own necessarily condemned to disappear with the blow, the pressure of reality, Baudrillard, um, because the political agency lies somewhere else beyond the image. I suggest that the masses stands for the Freudian drive, a powerful, vital source, an embodied force by the millions which could possibly be revolutionary provided that a political ideology indeed existed. Instead, Trump's poverty of thought keeps his own effect at the level of suggestion. His leadership produces an affective discharge, an idle, cathartic purge, purge that could indeed disrupt the establishment, yet bringing about no significant change, but most likely an involution to less civilized forms of politics. Dollar says that the drive of the masses requires both a representation and an act. In, Trump case, uh, in Trump's case, his lack of ideas and cynicism sustains nothing else but what Zizek calls a return to a public vulgarity, a debasement of the socialist sphere, or what Chomsky names a death knell for the human species. The declining of symbolic law. Trump's central rhetoric um, elements the use of what I call naked truth, um, uh, he, it have an appealing that stems from the fact that he addresses socially unaccepted and therefore, therefore unvoiced human tendencies, such as racism, sexism, denial of an unsettling climate change as a Chinese hoax, etc., that act precisely as a weakening of the symbolic order. It is by giving way first in words and then little by little in substance too, to quote Freud, that the ethical stance of human dignity and equality erode. The emergence of those psychical elements condemned to repression in the socialist sphere emerge now out in the public, he says, and stop political correctness. This is indeed the return of the repressed but there are no agencies to profit from this driving potential force. So there's the, the drive is what it is. It's just that we need some, some political agency. 
This is um, repressed, but there are no agencies to profit from this driving potential uh, force. Uh, this perhaps is a good example of Marcuse's repressive desublimation. One last paragraph. Um, although Clinton is not is another scary option, <laughs> but I am more concerned about Trump's rise to power is what he has already foreshadowed as this as the establishment of a police state, fascist as Jerry will call. He has promised to persecute illegal minorities that he designates all under the signifier Mexicans. The building of a wall and militarization of the south border, and also the unashamed public legitimization of torture practices, waterboarding, which he openly endorsed following the Brussels terrorist attacks of last March. Had he been in power there and, and then, he would have no problem, he said, an agitator, as Samir would say, to start a witch hunt, the interrogation of Muslims and their families as potential terrorists and the neighbors who might not turn them on. If there is something the Freudian unconscious teaches us, just to finish, is the impossibility of resolving the tensions between the individual and the other, which is the field of the social political, how we um, could approach things in the, so in the social, in the political. The perpetual Und the Hagen, the discontent in civilization, is a secondary layer of a complexity already established at the individual level, which has already a built-in otherness at the core of the self. We are in a perpetual dialectic between the image of ourselves, misrecognized and alienated in the other. Equally, we are in a perpetual dialectics with regard to our desire and the desire of the other. To think the political from psychoanalysis is perhaps to look at the crack, at the idiocy of our ways of enjoyment, and in the case of Trump, perhaps, rephrasing what Foucault asked in his intro to the anti-Oedipus of Deleuze and Guattari. How do we read our speech and our acts, our heart and our pleasures of fascism? How do we ferret out the fasc fascism that is ingrained in our behavior.